Haven't you ever had those times in your life where you just feel all consumed with tasting something again that you haven't had in years and years? That's really what I'm doing here is bringing back those incredible desserts, those incredible experiences that have gone extinct. I put myself through this process of resurrecting desserts because I truly feel that a good dessert can change the course of your day. I'm Valerie Gordon, owner of Valerie Confections, and I'm also a dessert anthropologist. The way this project of resurrecting historic desserts began was in 2009, the food editor from the Los Angeles Times Magazine asked me to create a Blum's Coffee Crunch Cake for an article that she was doing. And it was this amazing full circle moment because I grew up with that cake, I know that cake, and I miss that cake terribly. Blum's was an incredible bakery and cafe in California. There were eight locations. The last one closed in the 80s when the article came out, we literally received 125 phone calls from people going, oh my God, I want this cake. The desserts that I resurrected to date are, of course, the coffee crunch cake from Blum's. I've brought back the banana shortcake from Chasen's. The brown derby grapefruit cake is another cake that I've resurrected. And now soon to be the coffee esta sundae as well. The anthropology of the dessert resurrection is really one of the most interesting parts of all of this. I start the research process at the Central Library. There is a room, and this is a very well-guarded room, called the Menu Vault. There are menus that date back for 150 years. I find that looking at the actual menus is so much more gratifying than just pulling something up online because you're really getting to the heart and soul of the place. You're almost transported into that place at that time by holding something that these people held. You really are. And then I email a bunch of people or I call a bunch of people who were natives to Los Angeles or whatever city the bakery was in to find out, hey, do you remember this? Do you remember that? We always used to call this the adult Sunday because this is the, this is the one Sunday. my mom would eat. Can they describe the texture of a whipped cream? Can they tell me whether there was vanilla in it or not? I'm pretty sure they did one basic yeah. recipe for whipped cream and then okay. flavored accordingly. And right. It was little kid whipped cream. One cherry. Yes. This is amazing. Like you, <laughs> you have been indispensable. I'm not particularly interested in retro. It is about reliving those sense memories. It's sort of like when you hear a song that was your favorite song from 1982. You're really thrown back into that moment. It's become this very emotional, very fulfilling part of my job to bring these cakes back for people. Siggy Ron Hilmarsen is an Icelandic baker with an unconventional oven. He bakes bread by burying it underground, where it's heated for 24 hours by nearby hot springs. It's very common to see hot springs here in Iceland. There is constant lava crawling under us. This lava is heating up water, and this water comes boiling up on the surface. We could put it in the oven, but this is much more fun. Iceland is one of the most volcanic regions in the world, with 30 active volcanoes at any one time. That helps create an abundance of hot springs, some with boiling hot water, and Siggy uses them to his advantage. He specializes in baking huvabrod, a traditional Icelandic rye bread recipe that dates back hundreds of years. I know for sure that in this village, uh, I can track it down as far as late 1800 something. My grandmother taught my mother how to bake this bread, and my mother taught me. In uh, the hot spring rye bread recipe, we have rye, flour, sugar, baking powder, salt, and milk. We put this in a pot, 
we put butter in the pot, then we uh, wrap it with plastic foil and we put it down in our hot spring hole for 24 hours. It's very obvious to see if the ground is hot or not. I never use a thermometer. If I need to check the heat, I just use this one. Our biggest challenge is rain. If it rains a lot, these holes that we are using can cool down. And if they are not hot enough, obviously the bread doesn't bake completely. Everybody eats our bread. Our visitors, the locals, hot spring rye bread has a unique taste that you don't get from ovens. The texture of this bread is quite special. It's quite heavy, it's not the typical light bread. When you show this to travelers that come to Iceland and you see their faces, they go, wow. Then you start to think that this is quite amazing, actually. Le gâteau à la broche, c'est succulent, c'est extra et c'est authentique. In the middle of the French Pyrenees, there's a cake that's been spinning and spinning and spinning for over two centuries. Joseph here has formed a society to keep the recipe going. Je m'appelle Joseph Lost et je suis le président de la confrérie du gâteau à la broche d'Arro. And he's in charge of a cake with quite a curious past. Bien l'histoire du gâteau à la broche, le peu qu'on en connaît, ce sont les soldats de Napoléon, il y a environ 200 ans, qui ont ramené ça de leur retraite de Russie. The cake is a reminder that losing isn't always bad. As Napoleon's soldiers retreated from Russia, they picked up the recipe from several Eastern European countries and brought it all the way to the Pyrenees, where many people, including Joseph and his brotherhood, have kept the baking going. La confrérie a été créée il y a bientôt 20 ans. Euh, chacun s'est tourné, chacun s'est fait la pâte, chacun s'est fait mettre la pâte. So, what's in it? 129, 3 kg de beurre, 3 kg de sucre, 3 kg de farine, 2 litres de rhum et un grand verre de Ricard. Pour faire ce gâteau, il faut pratiquement 4 et presque 5 heures parce qu'il faut une heure pour chauffer le moule. Pendant ce temps, l'autre personne prépare la pâte. C'est bon Au bout d'une heure, nous commençons à passer des couches de pâte, des couches successives, et nous passons de la pâte pendant 4 heures tant qu'il reste de la pâte dans la marmite. Doesn't that hurt your arm? Ça ne me fatigue pas de tourner le gâteau à la broche. Et toi, Louis Non, non, pas plus que ça. Nous faisons une cinquantaine de gâteaux par an. Cette tradition perdure depuis 200 ans parce que le gâteau à la broche est devenu le gâteau incontournable de toutes les fêtes de famille. Je sens bien sûr de la joie en fabriquant ce gâteau parce qu'on a l'impression de transmettre quelque chose, une certaine valeur à tous nos jeunes ainsi qu'à tous les gens qui viennent nous visiter. Cakes, cookies, and brownies. No, we're not going to show you how to make them because they can be made with ease thanks to Betty Crocker, who was born in 1921 in Minnesota. Well, kind of. In 1921, the Washburn Crosby Company, now known as General Mills, ran a contest for people to complete a puzzle for the most coveted prize, a pin cushion. Yes, one of your very own. Surprisingly, a lot of people wrote in to claim their prize, but with a little P.S. How do I make my sponges? How much how long does how much flour, flour, flour should I use? They wanted baking advice. So the customer service department began to reply, and to make their tips seem more genuine, they signed their letters Betty Crocker. Betty, because it was a cheery, all-around, American-sounding name, and Crocker after a board member. Not being a real person didn't stop Betty Crocker from having a very successful radio show, the Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air, with a different accent in every state. Welcome to the Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air. But the lies don't stop there. 
let's talk about that added ingredient, the egg. You don't need to add a fresh egg to powdered cake mix, but science says it makes us feel like we aren't cheating and we're better providers. So thanks, Betty Crocker, for making us all feel like we know how to bake. These little custard tarts, these eggy, sugary treats, are everywhere in Portugal. Here, here, and here. Some say the pastéis de Belang is the original pastéis de nata, or custard tart. In this little factory, through this kitchen, there's a recipe that has been kept top secret for almost 200 years. Oh, not this one, guys. You can't get in here, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm Miguel Clarinha, and I'm part of the management of Pastéis de Blanc. This special recipe you will only find here at this shop. We sell an average of uh, about 20,000 uh, tarts uh, a day. In the summer, maybe around 40,000 cakes. A lot of cakes. Pastéis de Belém, as they call them here, are simple tarts, really. Egg yolk, milk, some flour, sugar. But it's how they make them, in complete secrecy, that makes these tarts a national treasure. We have six people knowing the recipe. In the family, my father, my cousin, and myself, Miguel Perinho. The three chefs, which is Vitor Domingos, Eliseu Ramiro, and Carlos Martins. The recipe is so secret, all the bakers sign non-disclosure agreements to keep the timeless tarts a true mystery. Stage de Blain uh, is one of the earliest recipes, at least here in Lisbon. We know that the recipe was invented in the monastery of Geronimus in the early 19th century. This one. Once they have the recipe, the chefs, now sworn to secrecy, are given keys to this door. They work inside the factory uh, in a separate room that we call the Oficina do Segredo in Portuguese. It's like the secret shop or secret room. They have to work in a separate room because the process can only be seen by them. Till today, we haven't found anyone that uh, explained the recipe as it is. If it happened, well, we probably would have to lock him up in the basement and throw away the key. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay, secret keeper, what's the best way to eat one of these custard tarts? <laughs> uh, usually, I like it uh, simple, but that's just me. Most people like with a little bit of cinnamon on top. Mm. This is the hard part of the job. Yeah, this is super hard. I don't know how you do it.